All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, let's start with the one of the policies that we have in our syllabus, uh, this time that's about addressing sexual misconduct. Um, here, the university tells that Title X makes it clear that the violence and harassment when is on sex and gender, which includes sexual orientation and gender identity and expression is a civil rights offense subject to the same kinds of accountability and the same kinds of support applied to offenses against other protected categories such as race, national origin, color, religion, age, status as a person with a disability, veteran status, or genetic information. Um, if you, you or someone you know has been harassed or assaulted, you are encouraged to report it to the university officials. You have Title X uh, coordinator and Office of Equal Opportunity and Affirmative Action, Office of the Dean of Students. You can file a police report and contact campus police and Department of Public Safety. Um, if you don't feel um, comfortable doing any of that, the youth victim support advocates provide free confidential and trauma-informed support services to students, faculty, and staff who have experienced interpersonal violence. To private, privately explore options and the resources available to you with an advocate, you can contact Center for Student Wellness. Okay, moving on to something lighter. Um, all right, so... Um, I want to also remind you about upcoming deadlines. Um, so today we had uh, the deadline for the uh, second homework. I hope you all had managed to submit your solutions. If you didn't, um, you still have those uh, two passes up to Friday at 2.45 uh, p.m. So please make sure if you are unfortunately not going to make it today uh, to submit it by Friday at that time. After that, you we simply won't take your homeworks. Um, next week on Wednesday, we have the deadline for the third homework. Um, and then on the February 15th, there is um, a deadline for the second component of the project. Yes, please go ahead. We have deadlines for the assignments at like 12 instead of 3 p.m. No, the idea uh, behind putting them before the lecture is that you then come to the lecture and listen to a new material. If you have deadline right after the after the lecture, no one will be here. You will all work on your homeworks. Um, that's one uh, reason. The other reason is that these homeworks are also grouped by the team. So um, if you skip, um, kind of like by the time we are talking about something new, you have finish that homework. So it kind of sets you on a good track to, uh, you know, follow the material uh, before we start something completely different. Yeah. Um, sorry, uh, I just put it so you know that it's, you know, you get the like a canvas reminder that that's happening. Yeah. But you will come here in person and I won't give you just a, a minute to solve the exam. So uh, this is just to kind of have all the deadlines in one place. Um, all right, so I was mentioning data collection that's due on February 15th. Um, and we should uh, give you uh, feedback on your proposals by uh, the end of this Friday, which will give you kind of 10 -ish days to uh, work on the data collection um, with our feedback in mind. Um, and to go a little bit over this component, um, let's open the web page. Yep. Oh, I, I don't mean to interrupt you. I just had a question about uh, min hatching. Um, yeah, yeah, let's so maybe I'm wait. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, let's maybe wait until we start the lecture. So data collection uh, report. Um, again, um, you can go to the website of the of the uh, course. And then if you click on the projects, you can uh, find uh, this description. Um, so this report should be at most one page uh, long, describing what data you have collected or are continuing to collect. To collect. Um, and often this, this part about collecting data is the most intensive part of your job as a data mining, um, whatever is the title, um, engineer. Um, so you need to report how you obtain your data, how large is your data, 
in what format are you storing it? And here you need to think about this abstract data type. And did you need to do anything to kind of change uh, change the format of your data to another one? Maybe if you're working with something that's very large. Um, okay, there are more things uh, written here, basically that you should focus on these abstract data types and that you really think about whether that data type makes sense for the data you are working on. Remember when we said last time, Okay, you want to compare something with uh, LP norms, but if your you know, dimensions are corresponding to widely different things, that might not make sense, and you need to do some extra stuff to actually make it sense. Um, also, you can't say, okay, I will convert, um, uh, um, I don't know, um, string or document into just list of words. Uh, we have learned better techniques by now, and we know that just converting them into a list of words won't be enough. Um, Okay, so please read this carefully. Maybe I, I forgot to mention something, and please don't forget that there is a deadline for for that. Any question uh, questions about this part? Okay. All right. Um, I also want to go a little bit over the uh, schedule. So. Uh, basically, with the today's lecture, we are finishing this whole uh, story about similarity, and then we are going to go on to a new topic, uh, clustering, which will also spend three lectures. Today, we are going to talk about some other ways to represent text and images, and this might be also helpful for you when you think about your uh, projects. So, um, this lecture, similarly to the distances, will kind of be important as a way to think about all the rest of the things we are going to do, but in a way it's not, um, we won't go over any algorithm specifically in this lecture, um, rather we will use this stuff later on. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Um, Min hashing question? Min hashing, we're just talking about similarity in general. Mm -hmm. I noticed we were using like sets of k grams. What about like the, the frequency with which a k-gram occurs, could that indicate like two documents are more similar if it wasn't restricted to just set? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So actually today we are going to talk about one another way of representing this text called TFIDF, where you are considering the frequency of a word in document and how many documents contain that word. Um, so you are right that there you could make a representation where frequency is relevant, and that's exactly what we are going to talk about today. Yeah. Is it usually relevant or like? So um, we will talk about the TF IDF today. Then we are going to talk about a whole other way of representing text using something called word embedding, sentence embedding, or sentence representations. And again, there isn't like a recipe of which thing you should use. It really depends on the problem and the, and the size of the data you are working on. So yeah, maybe through the lecture, I will have your question in mind and just um, kind of try to signal when I would use one thing over the other. So yeah, before the word embeddings were a thing, you would just use the FIDF and the frequency would be the main thing. But these days we are going to use some other stuff which doesn't include that information so explicitly. Okay, so yeah, today's lecture will be all about um, word and uh, sentence and image representations. Let's call them like that. Okay, and so far when we talked about representing text, uh, we have talked about bag of words representation when we had that vector and that each dimension corresponded to one word and the count of that word in that document, right? So we had bag of word vectors. Then uh, we also had just sets of k-grams. Then we also had represented text with uh, min hash signatures, which is um, also a vector, right? Um, however, if you open any any kind of um, text mining course, you will certainly see some other ways of representing text, and I want to go over some of them today. 
uh, for, for thinking about this other representation, what is useful to know is something called distributional hypothesis. Okay, and distributional hypothesis tells us that words that occur in similar contexts tend to have similar meaning. And we are going to exploit that to develop representations such that those representations, when we put them in a corresponding vector space, those that in, usually appear in the same context, that their vector representations are close together and otherwise they are separate. Okay, so I will just write down what distributional hypothesis means words uh, that occur in similar contexts. tend to have similar meanings. Okay, so just have this distributional hypothesis in mind when we are going over uh, the ways we are going to represent text today. And the first uh, or the next way to represent text um, is using TF-IDF. Okay. So here we will need a few, few components. One of them is called TF, TD. Um, and that's just the, um, so when you read textbooks, you will see it defined differently. This should be just the frequency. So it should be count of the, uh, the token T in document D over the, uh, the number of um, words in document. But sometimes you will just see it under the count. So some in some textbooks you will see the the and removed. So it seems like it doesn't have a huge effect when you do these things uh, computationally. So you might see either of these things. Okay, this is row count, and this is frequency. Okay. Another thing you will need is uh, IDF, but we'll first introduce DF of a term in a document. And that is the number of documents, number of documents that D occurs in. Um, Okay, so what we are actually getting at are the, the terms that occur in uh, less, um, less documents because those terms will make those documents special and it will be a way to kind of discriminate between two documents. So actually what we are looking for is IDF of a term, which is N over DF of the term. This should be, um, let's call it M as number of documents. So basically what IDF is telling us is um, if a word occurs in just a few documents, the IDF will be large. And that means that kind of signals that there is something special about this word. So when we compare two documents, uh, we are seriously considering this word. Um, usually we don't just use uh, IDF in this form. We apply logarithm of 10 to it. So another version is IDF T is log of 10 of M over DFT. Um, and the reason being uh, is that if you are working with a large collection of documents, now um, we can have um, uh, values of one, I don't know, uh, one, 10, 100,000. And these things become like very different from each other. When we are applying logarithm to them, we're kind of squashing them. So these differences become smaller yeah so n is the total number of terms and n is the total number of documents uh yeah n is the number of words in a document and m is the uh, number of documents all right so just uh, as an illustration if you have uh one then 
log would be zero. If you had 10, it would be one, 100, uh, it would be uh, two and so on. So when you are comparing the log, this uh, even though something has occurred 100 times uh, relative to something that occurs uh, 10 times, the, the difference becomes uh, smaller uh, when we squash it, squash it with the logarithm. That's the idea behind it. Okay, and then finally, the, we are defining the weight of the word in a document as TF of the of frame percent of the word multiplied with this IDF value of the term. So this is TF IDF weight, weighted value for word T in document D, in document D. Okay. Yep. Sorry, what was the idea? Um, inverse, inverse uh, DF, basically, yeah. Okay. So we are going to now take these values. So let's say we have, um, M words, and I know this is a constantly, I think that confuses you. Uh, so this could be, if you had N documents, you can kind of find all unique words in N documents, and that would be this list of TM to TM. Or you can take, if you're working just with words, all the words in a vocabulary in English. Um, with k-grams, it becomes kind of uh, hard to just find all of the possible k-grams in English. So usually you just take all the k-grams that occur in all the documents and you list them uh, as your uh, as your set of possibilities. Okay, so that we that's what we have in the rows. Then in the columns, we'll have our documents. So D1 to let's say DM. Okay. This value here, this is where we'll put the TF IDF value of the first term, first token in document one. All right. And that's how we are going to fill each one, each uh, uh, cell in this matrix. Does this make sense? Okay. So, um, this, uh, this metric is usually known as term document matrix. And in the literature, you will see two ways to uh, represent each document given this kind of uh, representation. You can just take the column, right? And I think that's the most frequent one with this is document vector representation. Um, but sometimes you know, people have also defined um, vector representation of, let's say, um, the document I as the vector representation, sum of vector representation of every word that occurs in the I. So uh, let's say T1 to vector representation of TK. And this vector representation would be this rows. And then, then divided by however how, how many there are, which is k. So that's another option. I think this option way less than the first one, but you know, they're all reasonable options to try. So this is one, and this is the second one. It's the second one name. Like centroid of um, word vectors. Yeah. And once you have this uh, representations of your documents, then you can just use a cosine similarity between them to say that document uh, one is this much similar to the other one. That's how you would measure the similarity between two documents represented with TF IDF. Um, and then uh, as in forward where you use count vectorizer, you wouldn't go about you know, doing something like this on your own, implementing a thing that will give you these kinds of metrics. You would go just to scikit-learn 
and find um, TF IDF vectorizer. Okay, and again, like with the count vectors, these vectors will usually be very sparse. So that's kind of a common problem we see with this uh, with this kind of representation. There is a lot of zeros. And that's a thing that another way of representing um, input text will help us with. Uh, before I move on to the to word embeddings, I just want to mention that there is, you might encounter BM25, and that's just more optimized TF IDF. So you know how we were putting those logarithms and stuff like that. Um, yeah, basically BM25 has the similar kind of uh, tricks to count for some situations you might encounter. But again, I see it being used way less, at least in textbooks. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't hear you well. Can you speak? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true, because you, you are measuring the frequency of the term in the first document. That will be more like general. You are looking for, okay, this is the frequency of this word in this document, but do I see this word in every single document? For example, um, common words like um, whatever forms of word to be like is, that's going to happen. Like there will be, this word will be probably frequent in your document, but also in every other document it will occur and you will be like, you know what? You are not important word and IDF will squash it. Um, so that's why you are kind of combining both what's happening locally and what's happening globally. Okay. So um, let's move on to the next thing. Um, the, the problem with uh, the count vectors, bag of word vectors, and the problem with the FIDF representations is that they are sparse. They have lots of zero. And for example, uh, here, uh, the most common version of this is that you put tm to t a t1 to tm b to be actual uh, actual words in english so you can have a vocabulary of the size 10000 so now that's a huge vector but it's very sparse and it turns out that that um, is not great and another technique had emerged and these are uh, another way of representing text which are word embeddings um you can also find them, so for words specifically, you will find them under word embeddings. Very often in when we talk about word or sentence or paragraph vector representation, vector, I just said it, vectors, we will say that these are representations. And a line of work that is learning these representations is called representation learning. So you will see terms like representation to be something very, very similar to a word vector. And the line of work that gives us this nice representations is called representation learning. Okay, so a nice property that this word embeddings will have is that they're going to be short, their dimension is usually you know, in the range of 50 to 1000 uh, values, and they're going to be dense. Now, this is a term we use when we say that uh, the entries in our vector will be real valued numbers and that they won't almost never will see zeros inside it. So we'll just see continuous values and very rarely you would see a zero in this vector. And then we call it dense. So real value the entries or numbers, no zeros. And they can be negative. Okay, have you heard about word embeddings before? No, barely. I see some nodding. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Did you hear about Word to Work? Yes, seems like more people have heard about Word to Work. So Word to Work is just a software that gives you these kinds of uh, uh, one one kind of these word representation. So Word to Work is a software or you know package whatever. And um, it has two algorithms associated to learn these nice representations for each word in, let's say, English uh, vocabulary. And one of them is called skipgram with negative sampling. Which is also known shorter to be SGMS. And it's one of the two. You, you will see also another one, which is called continuous uh, back of words. So if you see either SGNS or CBAO, this is uh, just um, two algorithms under word, word to back. Okay, so let's try to work through uh, how, how we get uh, word representations from uh, this um, SGNS algorithm. I won't go into all the details. I won't show you any training uh, objectives or whatever like that. I just want to give you like a high level idea of how this thing was trained. And I think that will help you when you think about these things in the future. All right, so remember when we talk, when I mentioned distributional hypothesis, I said that it says that um, words that often occur in similar contexts will have similar meaning. And when we kind of embrace that perspective to build this representation, what we get is vector space where these word embeddings, word vectors that occur very often in similar contexts will be close to each other and otherwise they will be very far away from each other. So what word to vec or this um, specific algorithm is uh, trying to do is trying to find, um, find such vector representations that we have vector space with such property. So, Let's see an example. Here would be lemon, a tablespoon of jam and a. All right, and let's say apricot is our word we are looking at at the moment. Then what your context is going to be are two words to the left and two words to the right. That's the context. And the way that the word to web is going to be trained is that given this word apricot and given this context, tablespoon of jam comma, you this model needs to estimate the probability that this word apricot is part of this context based on its similarity, uh, current representation of that word apricot is similarity to this other uh, embeddings of the words in this context. That's the general idea. Um, so basically we can visualize that. Let's say you have some vector Let's say its dimension is something around 300. I think that's what word to x dimension is. And this vector should represent your word apricot. And you start with some randomly initialized values here. They are just random. Then you will pass this thing to word to vec, which is itself a small neural network. And if you don't want to know what neural networks is, it's not super important right now. Just imagine you passed it through you know, you multiply this vector of, for apricot with another matrix and you apply some nonlinear function to it, such as you just squashed all negative values to zero and now you get another vector out of it. Then what you're going to do is you're going to do dot product, which is one kind of similarity uh, between the vector for apricot and each one of these uh, vectors in your context. So C11. C14. And of course, what we want to do is we want to maximize the similarity between these two 
vector representations. But to train a neural network, we also need negative examples. You know, imagine a binary classification task, you need positive and negative labels. So what this algorithm will do is just going to sample some uh, words that are not in context, multiply them with uh, do the dog product with your target embedding for apricot and minimize that. So we are going to maximize some similarities and minimize some others. And then we are just going to do back propagation, which is just the thing we do to change the, the weights uh, of these uh, matrices that are involved in this whole paradigm, including the values that are in our uh, representation of the word uh, apricot. And you will do this many, many, many times, and then eventually you will stop and you will get this vector that was initially randomly initialized. We'll have now have some values that were learned through maximizing and minimizing these similarities. Okay, is this somewhat clear? As I said, details are not super important. So they're always written on that vector at the bottom, right? Oh, I just um, wanted to say something like it's not in the context. So I said uh, not context, but you know, it doesn't really matter. It's just negative examples, basically. These, these other examples are called positive examples because they're actually in the context. Apricot is actually in, the, in their neighborhood. Okay, so it's not super important that you understand all the bits and pieces of this. What is important that you realize that this vector of the of the word apricot that we get at the end was learned such that we had maximized the, its similarity with the words that actually have been in its context in some text we found on the internet. Uh, and uh, its similarity with words that it had never appeared together with has been minimized. And that will produce as this vector space where words that have appeared in a similar context are close to each other and uh, far away otherwise. What is important to know when you're working with data mining applications is that now you ditch this whole word to vector algorithm, but you keep the values. So, at the end of uh, this whole procedure, we had this vector for every word in a vocabulary. Okay, and now what you can do is you can just use those vectors to represent your text. Uh, for example, um, if we had, again, a table spoon of apricot gem, that's your, that's your sentence that you want to represent with a vector. What you are going to do is go to Gensim library. You are going to import it. You are going to import word to vec. And imagine that this gives you a huge matrix where in each row you have word and uh, columns are just the dimension of its uh, word to vec representation that we have learned with this algorithm before. So basically what you can do, then do is just do the lookup. You can check, okay, where is the representation for A? Let's say it's somewhere here. Okay, now you can retrieve it vector and you can momentarily store it. Then let's say table spoon is here in, um, embedding matrix, again, you retrieve it, and so on. And in the end, to represent your whole sentence, what you can take is average of these uh, vectors. And you will get one vector, which will be a representation of your entire sentence. This is how you would typically use word to vec. Okay, are there any questions about this? Yeah, please. Uh, oh, you would have a huge vector if you concatenate them. So if you had, the dimension is, if I remember correctly, 300. And if you had 100 words in your input, now you would have, uh, what, 30,000 dimensional vector. And that will make everything more computationally intensive. So 
just averaging them out is the simplest way to get again small dense representation. In the end, um, like at least in uh, classification setup, what you would do then with this sentence is train a classifier, which means multiplying this vector with another matrix. And if your initial vector was 30,000 dimensional, then you would have a matrix that is gigantic instead of a smaller one. And also the length of different inputs will vary. So if you had concatenated them, you would have different dimensional vectors for different inputs. So now you can compare them with a simple cosine distance metric, for example. Yeah, but there is a reasonable question to wonder like what happens when you average? Do you cancel some information? Do you lose something and so on? Okay, so as I said, um, you would use uh, something called GenSim. I will share this stuff. I will show you a bunch of random things today um, and I will share them later with you. Uh, but to use word embeddings, you will just import this library called GenSim and you will import then GenSim from GenSim models where to vec and then you would initialize it. And then uh, for let's say word speaker, you can find the most similar words to word speaker, just by using one line of code, uh, which would give you here chair, chairman, chairwoman, president, gentleman, tonight, and it kind of diverges, right? Yeah, so it's very easy to, to use it and get these uh, representations once you have this nice library written for you. Um, as I said, I will show you random things. So if you like Wordle, there is also Wordle version with these kind of vector representation where you try to guess uh, which word has a nearest similarity um, for the word you can't see, which is kind of kind of hard. Yeah. Okay, going back. All right. So remember when we talked about um, bag of words um, representations, we did mention there is something kind of unappealing about them. Do you, do you remember what was that thing? Can you remind me what were the problems with bag of words when we had counts? Sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, exactly. We kind of um, didn't consider the this the the order in which the words are coming. When we do this averaging, we are also discarding the uh, the order. Um, another problem with these kinds of things is uh, when we have uh, words that have multiple meanings, uh, such as word bank can be a financial institution, but it can also be a land next to a river, or head can be, you know, body part, it can also be uh, a leader and header in a document. Um, with word to back and other similar representations of words, we are completely disregarding that the word has a specific meaning in a specific context. It will always be represented with the same uh, word, word embedding that is stored in this embedding matrix, uh, which is an issue. And this is why something called contextualized representations had, uh, had emerged. Um, okay, um, I do want to still mention something about word embeddings. Um, so I will come to this point about how to fix uh, the fact that we are representing words with the same vector, although the same on the surface of the they are the same, but they can have different meaning. Uh, before we go into all of that, um, I want to talk a little bit about analogies. or relational similarity. So um, whenever you read anything about word embeddings, you will see these kinds of stuff that um, there was this um, um, test in the 70s where you could do stuff like A is to B as A star is to what? Uh, for example, you could have king is to man as woman is to and then you could guess queen. And there is a specific model for doing this uh, that comes from the 70s called the 
parallelogram model for analogy problems. Uh, and under this um, model, you would basically say, okay, um, let's say we have a vector for man and king. You would say, okay, uh, man minus king is this vector. And if I add the vector for woman, I will get in that location um, something like queen. So here, this point is you can, um, if you have a vector space uh, like the one we have, you can do just a simple um, operations with vectors. You can do man, vector of man minus vector of king plus woman. If I take the nearest neighbor of, of whatever is here that exists in my embedding space, I would get a vector for queen. Similar stuff can be like uh, Paris minus France plus Italy goes to, what do you think? Rome, yeah. So we are kind of getting the information about the capital of a country. Okay, so you will standardly see stuff like this. And this is kind of, in a way, when, when at least I saw it for the first time, it's mind blowing because um, analogical reasoning plays a crucial role in human cognition when we learn new knowledge and when we learn how to understand and apply new concepts. So the fact that we have a vector space where we can do analogical reasoning uh, seems, uh, seems um, kind of like a huge achievement. Um, some other recently, maybe you have seen it or not, if you have um, known about word embeddings before is that OpenAI, which is the organization that had produced GPT has released their own embeddings. I honestly don't understand what is fancy about this because we have seen this technique in a while, but it can also give you these kinds of uh, representations if you are willing to pay for it, which again is surprising to me that people would pay if you could just use uh, open source software. Um, but someone, because it has been released recently, someone was trying this analogical analogies again uh, with uh, open AI's embeddings, uh, which found some really funny things to me, like professor without university is a pastor, which I sincerely hope is not true, or bread without flour is beer, and technology without engineering is uh, techno. Um, so yeah, you can get a lot of funny stuff, but it kind of goes along what I want to say next. And that's that there are line of work that also has uh, evaluated this kind of analogies more robustly. And uh, they have shown that the performance of whether you can this, do this kind of uh, vector minus vector plus another vector uh, really is limited to what kind of relations are you looking at. If you're looking for simpler location relations, you might see something reasonable. Yes. So is that how I, I guess this kind of makes sense in my head because I have to be sometimes like if you ask me like what is the most like cited economic paper, mm -hmm. it'll give you false answers. Mm -hmm. But that's because it's basing it off of like kind of the neighbor associations you're talking about. Yeah, that's a reasonable, uh, reasonable um, explanation. I would say there are multiple of like reasonable explanations for why it would have uh, factual incorrectness. For example, maybe sometimes in the past, some entity had been that entity, it predicts, and it just doesn't consider that things have changed. So there are basically there are many reasons why uh, chat GPT kind of models can make factual um, errors. But in the gist of it is that, yes, a lot of these things are represented by these distributional representations, which are not discrete. Uh, you know, we don't, we can't localize in this vector where exactly this fact is stored. So, um, which is one reason why we, is better to use more simpler K-grams or TF-IDF approaches if you just want to check, do some pre-processing of your text. You don't need to do something uh, super, super uh, elaborate because with these kinds of things, you have less and less control of what this is aside of this representation. These dimensions in these vectors are not uh, 
don't have a meaning basically. Okay, so I was saying how some of these relations can give you, you know, like um, really expected guesses, but for a lot of them, like some of uh, which we are seeing here, you don't get uh, much uh, information. Um, and I will share this with you, but there are basically papers that explore this uh, further and they show that Yes, when for some cases it's really neat what these things can do, but uh, for many things they can't. They can't really do this uh, this thing. So whenever you see this kind of analogies, take it also with a grain of salt. Um, uh, so yeah, the the outcome of this paper is that parallelogram model alone is insufficient to uncount how people form even the even the simplest analogies. And there is another one uh, in a in a similar spirit. So. Kind of cool to see, but also lots of uh, problems with this. Okay, um, another problems are um, any kind of biases uh, that relates to society. Uh, so these models will uh, not only um, exhibit what we see in the world, they will also amplify it. So with these anal analogies, for example, uh, one of these papers, Okay, maybe I should later. You can say uh, you can check what uh, happens if you do vector of programmer minus oops mem plus woman will tell you that the closest thing is I think home homemaker whatever that word means. Or if you have a doctor without father plus mother, you would get a nurse. So it's kind of um, exhibiting what uh, has historically uh, been uh, biased, kind of biases of what kind of jobs uh, women can do. And this is called uh, then uh, this kind of, uh, exhibiting this kind of bias um, result in what we call uh, allocation harm. So um, you will, allocate resources such as, uh, let's say, uh, credits or jobs to some uh, social groups uh, less than to others, just because in, maybe in the background, let's say you are representing uh, people's resumes with these word embeddings. And then um, because you're looking for a programmer and your word embedding doesn't associate that with women's names, it will not show you women's resumes, for example. So. Um, my point here is that you should really be careful when you work with these word embeddings and depending on what kind of application you are doing, you have to remember that these uh, the, you can cause these kinds of allocation harms with your algorithm. Um, I said that these things exhibit these known biases we have in society, but they also uh, amplify them, which means um, basically, um, if you look at any gender terms, uh, they become even more gendered in these vector spaces, in these embedding spaces. Uh, they were then they what they were in the input statistics. So if you take your data that your model is trained on, you kind of look at these uh, metrics that tell you something about how um, about gender biases, and then you look at these uh, uh, representations. You use similar metrics. You will see that these uh, metrics become uh, even worse. Um, besides um, allocation harm, there is also representational harm. Um, and this is uh, similarly caused uh, by these things when we just ignore certain uh, certain groups. Just ignore or demean groups. So um, one thing that has kind of emerged uh, as, a, as a theme is the biasing of these word uh, embeddings. These are algorithms that take your uh, word embedding and try to remove anything that can be associated with certain uh, demographics. Um, and it's, it, it is really, really hard to do this. So I want you to remember this, that there is a solution to this problem. It is an open research question how to do this. Uh, and if you see, you know, any algorithm that claims to remove any uh, of these attributes, there is no guarantee that has really happened. And um, here, 
I would really recommend reading uh, this paper, Lipstick on a Pig, which says, okay, uh, we're just slapping this uh, things that should de bias them, but doesn't really de bias them. Um, this was published in 2019. Since then, a lot has happened, especially in the group uh, led by Joab Goldberg. So if you're interested in these kinds of things, how to how to debias this uh, uh, word embeddings, I recommend looking at the, the latest line of work from uh, that group. Um, for amplifying biases, uh, there is uh, this paper and the paper that has first shown that, uh, or you know, maybe it's the most prominent paper that has raised the issue that these uh, representations uh, could exhibit these biases uh, is uh, this one. So I will link all this all this paper in Piazza later on. Okay, any questions about about word embeddings before we move to contextualized representations? Okay. So uh, I mentioned contextualized word representations um, when I said that certain words can have multiple meanings, right? Okay. So the problem here is ambiguous word. Right, so basically what has changed in 20s 17, 2018 is that instead of training these virtual models that learn these static uh, representations, so I will write this down because it's important term, static embeddings. Um, so instead of learning algorithms like that, which for every word in your vocabulary give you one vector representation, no matter how this use can later on be used, uh, we have started to train models that uh, make this word representation based on the context. So basically you would have um, uh, your sentence, tablespoon of Africa gem. Um, and now you would feed it into some model. And here, I don't wanna go into details of what these models are. The architecture itself is called transformer. Um, I can link into Piazza another lecture I have given last semester where I explain what this is, but the important ingredient of transformer architecture is something called self-attention. And what self-attention mechanism is doing is basically um, measuring how important each one of these words in the input is for other words in the input. So, you will learn the representation of the word depending of what other words you have seen. Okay, so basically in this self-attention layer, you will have the vector representation of word A, and you will do cross product with representation of every single other word in input. You will combine all of that somehow and feed it into the next layer of your architecture. To train a system like that, um, what has been proposed in 2019 is to take one of these words, replace it with a mask token, and then uh, learn to train the model to reconstruct that um, word, which is also forcing to the model to look what are the other words in the input. Um, and then uh, based on those other words, you can also get the sense of the word we are looking for. So this is how these models were trained again. Um, as with where to work, you can train the model and ditch it, uh, ditch the actual model and just look at these representation in, in the end. Usually these days we don't ditch the entire model. We also can do uh, some uh, stuff later on, such as a procedure called fine tuning, where you can you know, tailor your, your model and your representations for the model to the data you have. So if you had slightly different kind of text, you can do a little bit more of this uh, uh, training where we reconstruct these mask tokens in the input and have better representations. The way you would um, use um, one of these models is basically you would feed it uh, your text and it would give you these representations at the end. But now these representations are considering what other words are the input. They're not static. And again, you can do just the averaging. However, with certain models, there were some special 
uh, tokens put at the beginning, such as CLS token, and you can reuse the representation of that token to say this is my representation of my sentence because every token has attendant to every other token. So every representation in the output is actually considering everything you had in the input. So here you could take just one of them, but I think still it's more standard to average all of them out. Um, okay, so I did wanted to show maybe how this looks like. I don't know whether there is a huge value to it, but um, maybe when I share later on, just so you know, this exists. This is basically one of these models uh, It's called BERT. It was trained with this uh, mask language modeling objective I have described. And the way you would use it is to have your sentence with this special CLS token. Each one of these tokens will have a special index. And then each one of these uh, indices will uh, correspond to a lookup in your embedding matrix with your static embeddings. Um, and then you are going to feed those static embeddings to the, to the layers where you are going to use this self-attention to change every representation of every token in the input such that the information about other tokens is considered uh, in the representation of a specific token. And then at the end, you will get vector representation for each one of these um, that you can average to get your final, um, final uh, sentence representation. Um, and actually, if you are going to do that, it's better to use this library called uh, Sentence Transformers, where basically you get this in just a few lines of code. Uh, so here uh, you will just have, you will um, use model, initialize it to the Sentence Transformer, you will give it sentences, and then uh, you will just embed it by doing model dot and code. So you can get all of this stuff for um, very, very easily. Um, however, one problem with uh, these sentence encoders and uh, using this contextual representation is that um, there is the maximum sequence length you can uh, set here because the following matrix will have uh, will depend on whatever is the max input sequence length here. So it's usually set to 512. And for some application, that's simply not uh, long enough. So there are now newer model coming out, such as uh, Longformer, that uh, basically um, help you with these texts that are uh, that are way longer by adjusting these self-attention matrices. Way beyond uh, the, the scope of this course, what these uh, long former or transformers for long inputs look like and how they operate. But if you are working with a problem and you have lo long input and this input is longer than 512 tokens, you just need to consider what you are going to do it. You could truncate it to whatever is in the first 512 tokens, but that might discard lots of information. So if you are in a situation like that, just know that these kinds of models uh, exist and that you could use some of them. Um, for example, uh, I have least recently learned about AI incident database, which is a database where people can report incidents that AI has done. And here to uh, kind of represent, um, maybe I can show you actually, each one of these incidents is, um, is actually a news article. So for example, here on CNN. So what they have done here is took the, this article related to that incident or article where incident is uh, reported, get an embedding from a long former, and then use some of these uh, dimension uh, reduction techniques that we'll talk about later on to map it onto this two dimensional space. And now you can see which kind of incidents are related to each other. So this is just an example how you don't need to know anything about long former, but you can use it to get the kind of visualizations that might be helpful for you. Okay, I believe that's all I wanted to say about text, but I do want to talk a little bit about images as well. Uh, any questions about representing text with embeddings and sentence representations? Okay, so um, you can tell I'm an NLP researcher because our images 
are not getting equal attention, um, but at least 20 minutes. Okay, so with images, um, we will also have these kinds of representations that are very similar to word representations in a sense that we are going to get the output of some neural network and use that as an as a representation of our image. But before we get to that, um, the most prototypical way of thinking about an image is just as a matrix of pixels, right? And then each one of these pixels has a, has a value. Uh, if we talk about the grayscale, then these values will be from uh, zero to one, right? Um, however, color is a valuable uh, source of information. So usually we would use RGB representation where we would have basically three matrices, one for red, one for green, and one for blue. Um, these three different matrices are called channels. And your image is now represented not with the matrix, but with the tensor, because you have this third dimension of different channels, right? So, yes, um, so now this um, RGB representation of, uh, of your image is a tensor, because previously you had with a uh, grayscale here, you had just a matrix. Now you have three channels. When you put them together, you get a tensor. Do we know what tensor is? Okay, and it's also good to know. Um, okay, so the easiest way to explain what tensor is is to think about it as just a generalization of a matrix, right? So we had uh, a line, then we have a vector, then we have a matrix, which is has two dimensions. Now imagine a cube. So you take n matrices and you kind of combine them, uh, you concatenate them together. Now you have these third dimensions. Uh, anytime you have more than two dimensions, we are talking about tensors. The concepts of tensors is incredibly important. That's why we have a library called TensorFlow. Uh, whenever you do anything related to machine learning, deep learning, you will work with actually tensors. Um, there is, that's basically it. There isn't much to say about it. Um, there are, you know, we will talk later about matrix factorization. You can do tensor factorizations and so on. Um, but for now, it's just maybe think about it as I have a matrix and I have, I'm have i adding another dimension that's a cube and that's kind of what a visualization of a tensor is. All right, so I will write this down, the answer. Okay, um, so each value here will be uh, from will be something from zero to two hundred fifty five. Zero would be black, and two hundred fifty five is white. Same here. Zero is black. One is white. Uh, so basically, each one of these uh, there are. Okay, doesn't matter. Um, there is also something called RGBA. A stands for alpha, and that's for opacity. So how much you know, how, like the see-throughness of the of the color. So that would be from zero to hundred percent. Okay. Um, and then um, before deep learning became a thing, uh, there were something called SIFT features to represent. Uh, represent um, images in a, in a clever way. Uh, and you can read about it in the notes. I do wanna go over, over these deep learning outputs, outputs of neural networks as a, as a mean to get your representation of your image because that's something that is super widely used today. And I, have, I believe it's totally overtaken as a way to represent image. Um, so one, um, one um, common way to get a representation of an image is to get an output of something that's called faster RCNN. Um, can I get a raise of hands of how many people have heard about convolutional neural networks? Okay, that's a decent amount. 
Um, again, um, talking about explaining what the convolutional neural network uh, is would take a lot of time, but um, I will try to just give a little hint of, of, what's, of what's going on. You would get your you know, image or one channel of your image, and then you would use a so-called slider window, uh, maybe of size three by three, and you would apply it to the patch of your image, okay? And you will uh, multiply the corresponding patch of your image with that uh, uh, little slider weight matrix, and you will get some number here. And then you will shift your window, and then you will get another value. And so on that you are just going to concatenate with the values you had before, and this will give you a vector. So this is one vector that we are going to call feature map. And that's going to represent your, your image, and then you can multiply it with some output weight matrix to get some, let's say, probability of this being a club, um, an image that represents a dog or not. Um, way more details are necessary to fully understand what the covenant is. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to uh, mention here specifically is that there is this model called faster RCNN. It is one convolutional neural network that has also be been pre-trained, like the text representations were pre-trained with text. This, um, this model is also pre-trained with some image data. Um, let me find the image in the paper. Okay. All right. So basically, what happens when you apply faster RCNN to an image is that you get this um, uh, this uh, image. You have lots of convolutional neural network layers. You will get some kind of feature map representation of your image, and from that from that representation, your network will predict what are the uh, basically bounding boxes where uh, potential objects are. And then uh, so basically predicting four coordinates for because the box is defined by four coordinates. And then once it has uh, these proposals for bounding boxes for each one of them, it will tell, I think there is a cup here, a chair here, and a vase here. And you will get that. Uh, so classes for each one of these potential objects, but you will also get the vector representation for each one of them, including the entire image. So what we typically do. You don't need to know any detail about how this works, but you can go to uh, PyTorch. You will uh, import Torch Vision, which comes with PyTorch. You are going to load that faster RCNN uh, model here, and then you can get this vector representations where each one of these objects are as an output in just a few lines of code. And then one of them will be representation of the entire image. And you can use that to do something else, to calculate some similarities in your data set or whatever you, your goal is. Um, in research, we typically don't discard vector representations for those objects. We also include them because they are valuable to tell us, OK, these kinds of objects are there. But maybe for the types of problems you are looking in this course, like similarity, just a representation of the whole image is, is sufficient. Okay, now, as everything else, uh, OpenAI has overtaken. And uh, for a while, faster RCNN outputs were just the thing we did. I would say since this paper was published to 2021, even today, you would use those representations. Uh, however, last year or two years ago, I can't remember, uh, OpenAI has uh, released this model called CLIP. And this model is, again, a neural network that's pre-trained on some image and text data. So here you have a bunch of images and you have their captions, such as whatever, some kind of file. Um, and you would have, as a part of your neural network, something that gives you a representation of an image. And something that gives a representation of a text. And then you would combine these two representations somehow, doesn't matter how, to, to learn that these two things are associated, that this is truly the caption of this image. Once you are done with your um, 
with your pre-training, as with work to work, as with work, you can just use the representations that get uh, that you get out of this model. So you can get the representation of an image by just using this image encoder and forgetting everything else. And this is what's happening these days. If we want to get the best representation of your image, you would go to click a feature, you would extract click features from this image encoder. Then you learn how you extract the features from faster uh, RCNN. And then you would use it for something else. In this course, that would mean that you would go and get these features so that let's say the similarity with other images. Um, that said, now, this is not a small model anymore. And just finding a hardware that you can load this model and get these representations uh, representations for your images uh, fast is, uh, is, is kind of a bottleneck. You probably don't have uh, necessarily means to do that. So this is again, kind of a situation where you need to think, okay, I know what would be the kind of probably the best, but do I, can I actually get that and if you can't, you need to look into the less intensive resources such as uh, those Swift features that we haven't looked into that are in the notes. Um, another problem with both word to egg and uh, Bird and with uh, Clip and with Covnets is that representation will be great if you have text or images that are alike those that you have seen in the pre-training data. And now because our pre-training data is becoming so enormous and so diverse, usually that's not really a huge problem. But for example, Clip has been pre-trained on natural images such as images of dogs or whatever. Now, if you want to work on X-ray images, that's a whole other line of you know, images and representation you get from CLIP might not be the best one. And basically researchers are now in the process of understanding like how you can still use these best representations to get even good representations for these other domains. But that's something to be very mindful of if you are looking for representing your text or your image for doing something, uh, some actual applications with those uh, representations the, that the out of domain is is a is a huge issue so that's why typically people in humanities when i don't know um for social sciences when they want to use this kind of representations they say that very often these things are so different from the text they are dealing with uh, that let's say using k-grams is more useful to them than working with this uh this representation so again it goes back to what kind of problem you have and what kind of data are you working with. Uh, just like word representations, um, image representations are also not, uh, you know, they are also uh, exhibiting these social biases and amplifying them. Um, I really, really like this paper a lot. I recommend reading it. Um, here, basically, they raise a point about how, you know, you have those debiasing methods or balancing methods where, you know, uh, all genders are represented equally, whatever that means. Uh, but the problem with images is that these models are really look good at making associations of what's happening in the background with these attributes. So, for example, you can mask actual person, but um, the model will still say that, for example, in this image, you see a woman just because there are so many pictures of women on the internet with kitchen and babies in the background. So despite that being irrelevant, the model can still uh, can still capture these associations and do uh, uh, the bias predictions, basically. Uh, so yeah, that's something else to have in mind. Okay, now you decided I will use an output of ComNet to represent my image, but I'm working with some problem which might be really, um, you know, prone to uh, propagating, you know, to propagating these kinds of representation and allocation harms, then you should really think about how you will go about this. Okay, so basically that's all I wanted to say about all of this. Of course, um, you know, um, we just kind of touched on the high levels of all of this stuff. And my goal wasn't that you really understand the details of each one of these algorithms. Um, I mean, models we have that gives us this representation, 
rather that you know that these things exist and that you can use them without knowing fully that how Cognet work or how it was trained or how BERT was uh, trained or so on. Um, these are useful representations. All right, that's all. Thanks. Um, 